This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Hey, one of the most challenging parts of doing art as a job is trying to stay in that perpetual state of creativity. You're constantly trying to get the best ideas out of yourself. You're always seeing things through a creative lens, but the thing is, it is inevitable that at some point your brain will shrivel up like a little prune and you will have to seek creativity from other sources. So one of my favorite things to do whenever I'm feeling like a little shriveled prune is to put myself at the mercy of the universe. And by that I mean, ask my followers over on Instagram to send me a bunch of aesthetically pleasing images, which I will then use as prompts to make some weird, wacky character designs. So normally whenever I do this, I basically take one image that is one prompt that gets turned into one character, and they're all kind of independent, they don't have a shared universe or anything. But in this week's episode, I want to change that, apparently to just make things a little bit harder on myself. This time, the caveat is that these characters will exist in a shared universe, that I have to figure out through some weird randomly generated prompts. And some of the characters will also be based on multiple images that I somehow string together. So now that you know the ground rules, let's take a look at those submissions. And I should probably also get out of my bathtub. <laughs> So as usual, I put out a little call to action for image submissions over on Instagram. So hey, if you would like to participate in future episodes of this, you should go follow me on Instagram. But to get into these, let's start out with Will, a regular on the channel, always sending me straight up gold and oh. <laughs> Will does not disappoint today. So what else we got? Ooh, is it weird that I want to be in that box? Go for a little ride? Caleb. Oh, who are you? Hello. Oh, am I the only one who like tears up whenever you just see something really cute? Or, or am I just five? Oh, and I accidentally turned my phone off. I like how the images that I've screenshotted so far are like a casket and the cutest little fox plushie you've ever seen. I love it whenever people send in just weird surrealist art. I think they're trying to just like weird me out. Sorry, buddy, you're not quite there yet. Well, I'm, I may have spoken too soon. Thank you, Sad Salad. Um, I hope your salad gets more interesting. I already really like the ones where it's just nature that looks like eyeballs. I really like eyeballs. So, <laughs> the cat with the drip is what jumped out at me. Cause how could it not? This cat is so dripped up. Ooh! <laughs> Whenever I make a guttural noise like that, you know you're in. Ooh! Why do I like all of these images together for like one character? Why do they kind of match? That's a good cat right there. <laughs> okay, this is cool. The way the sun is in the center and everything. Look at me explaining why the photographer took the photo in the first place. That also, so good. Kind of irresponsible though, when you think about it. Cause like, how are you going to deter children from smoking? Whenever you could look this cool, look at that. <laughs> New aesthetic just dropped, botanical Roman empire. <laughs> this is uh, what people probably imagine whenever I tell people that my brother is a vegetarian. They're like, so is he just, is he in the woods with lettuce on his head? Is that what he does? Whoa, that's a good chair. Oh my gosh, that's a good chair. One of these days, I'll, I tell you what guys, I am gonna have my hands all over a chair. I'm gonna be customizing the heck out of the chair. Editing this is going to be hell. Yo, this is really cool. I haven't seen this one before. I have seen a bunch of the other variations on this and honestly, like I just wanna make one of these in general just for my wall. I think that would be sick. Ah uh, yes, me and the boys on a Thursday night. This is what I mean. This is what people like to send to me. They're like, let me find the most cursed thing that I've ever seen in my entire life and send it to this YouTuber that I don't know. Try to provoke a reaction. I'm not complaining, by the way. This is pretty great. You guys are supplying me with some good food. Not this stuff you guys send me. I don't even know what it is, but it's cool and I like it like that. And finally, I'm just gonna say it now, this is probably gonna make it in. Why is that my aesthetic at the moment? My winter aesthetic is a blood pond. I am now going to go deliberate and consider my options and probably just be in a little ball of indecisiveness for the next several hours. Let's see what future Kira decides on. Approximately 10 hours later. The images that I ended up settling on this week are number one, this cicada molting out of its little exoskeleton, which was submitted by Elias. This 
deliciously terrifying monster cake, which was submitted by official bug catcher. This beautiful ornate candle holder, I think, which was submitted by Winter. A blood red pond in a snowy landscape submitted by MK. And a hand extending out of a frame submitted by Scales. A little Venus flytrap submitted by Rosemary Tin Illustrations. And a burning field submitted by Kelstitch. And finally, you know I had to do it. This mysterious coffin wielding fellow submitted by Will Schmidt. And this fox plushie submitted by Mauve slash Caleb. I know this is a lot of images, just, just trust the process. <laughs> Okay, so I have selected the images that I want to turn into characters this week, and I kind of have a rough idea in my mind of what kind of characters I want them to be, but I also thought, hey, you know what? Why not make things even more difficult for myself, place even more constraints on this video by randomly generating the genre and the setting of this group of characters? So I have selected a random genre generator that is going to be determining my fate today, and I have it set up for one. So I'm gonna hit generate and we'll see what comes up. Oh boy, oh geez. Magical realism. Okay, what is this? A literary genre in which fantastical things are treated not just as possible, but as also realistic. Actually, I think that works pretty well. All right, let's find a setting generator. Story setting generator. Maybe this will be promising. Um, oh God, a Soviet era kingdom connecting to disparate parts of a city in the Renaissance. I'm not really vibing with the whole Soviet era part of this. Ruined forest where a once thriving mining community existed in World War II. Here's the thing, I just don't want this to connect to like actual world history. To me, that feels weird. Let's roll one more time, fingers crossed. Give me something I can work with. An abandoned and run down amusement park with malfunctioning rides and animatronics in a world where time moves backwards. Hey, you know what? Let's do it, let's commit to this one. This sounds like a fun time and it's gonna challenge me for sure. Oh boy, okay. So now that I know what's going on with my weird little ensemble of characters, it's time to get designing. Hey. One of the things that you probably need if you're a character designer is a portfolio, and you can easily build one of those with this video sponsor, Squarespace. One of my favorite things about Squarespace is that they make it really easy to build a website so that you can just focus on what matters, populating it with your Sonic OCs. You can choose from dozens of professionally designed, flexible website templates to find the perfect foundation for your brand style. And from there, adding work to your portfolio is as easy as uploading your portfolio pieces to your main gallery, and automatic image scaling will organize your pieces into an appealing format for you. Squarespace's website builder Fluid Engine allows you to customize everything with easy drag and drop features so that you have full control over things like text, colors, media, and all the website pages you could ever want. And if you're a seller, Squarespace can handle that too because they have an integrated e-commerce platform where you can sell things like digital media, physical goods, and even services like classes. And you can even decipher what media and products keep visitors engaged with your website with Squarespace's extensive website analytics. So if you want to create a website or portfolio to populate with whatever character designs you want to stick on there. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch, head to squarespace.com slash prickleyalpaca to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you so much to Squarespace for bankrolling this week's video. Now let's get back to it. So whenever I was originally working on this video, I had the fun little thought that, hey, it'd be kind of cool if I took you along with me whenever I did the character breakdowns and kind of brainstormed and came up with ideas for these, and I did do that. However, this is already like at least a 40 minute video and the cut of those clips is like another 12 minutes. So I just don't feel like it would be digestible if I inserted that into this video. But I'm not leaving you high and dry. No, no, no. You can still view those clips and get insight into my very strange mind if you just head over to patreon.com slash pricklyalpaca. You can access a bunch of different bonus content for this video, including the cut of that extra little video of the breakdowns, PNG and PSD files for the artwork that I made, a Word document detailing all of the characters. So if you do want to see that again after you finish watching this video, patreon.com slash pricklyalpaca. Link will also be in the description. And because this video won't make any sense if I don't at least include stills of the breakdowns so that you can like read them, I'm gonna do that now. You can pause the video or something if you want to see the stills of the breakdowns in more detail. Okay. So first 
first up, I figured I would start with the character who is the matriarch of the group, and I would also take this time to establish a little bit of lore. Because I admit the whole rundown amusement park and time loop thing was a little bit difficult to work into this group of characters, but I think I figured out kind of a creative solution for this. In my breakdown, I mentioned that this character would probably be mature, classy, a little older, sort of a wise, complex mentor type of character. I also mentioned that she would probably be a fan of ornate things, have her general style modeled after the statue, and maybe have a bit of like a mermaid or fish theme. And by extension, I feel like this character would have like water manipulation abilities, but I am getting a little bit ahead of myself. So for this character's backstory and the backstory of the time loop amusement park, this character used to be a performer in a circus. She would do water tricks and put out fires whenever some of the fire dancers messed up a little bit. But at one point that traveling circus was attacked by a group of bandits and there were very few survivors and the survivors that did make it out were completely scattered and several of her co-workers children fell into her care during the attack and they escaped with her. And since their parents didn't make it, she felt obligated to provide for them. So when she stumbled upon an old abandoned amusement park, she decided to renovate it and turn it into a new version of her old show, a place where weary travelers could come for entertainment, refreshment, and a few friendly faces. And this time it would be significantly safer from bandits because a lot of the new performers are also fighters. So all this eventually leads to a successful business and a new rebuilt amusement park, new acts, fix rides, she's thriving. However, little does the new park leadership know that the park was abandoned in the first place because it had a little bit of a curse placed upon it. And you guessed it, it's one of those pesky little time loop curses where nothing really works right. You fix a ride, but then it breaks again. You bake a cake, and no you didn't, it disappears. Patrons pay you, but then turns out the day never happened. Animatronics will try to assault the guests. You're riding the Ferris wheel but then the entire wheel disappears. Enclosed spaces like bathroom stalls and Ferris wheel cars turn into little mini time machines. It's just a place where nothing is quite right and it's always isolated and unpredictable. Patrons generally describe it as just a little bit glitchy, but these glitches also arguably kind of boost amusement park lore. It's intriguing. It makes people want to come and see like, hey, is this place really cursed or is it just a good time? So our matriarch is understandably overwhelmed by this because the, she's the, the main person at the park, she owns the place, she manages the act, she scouts talent, she has to be really strict to keep everything in order. On top of that, she has a role in the park's entertainment lineup, she's the tarot card reader and the fortune teller, and she also still occasionally does her water act alongside some of the fire dancers. She also puts on little water shows, telling exciting stories about her past. And on top of all of this, she has to use her magical powers to maintain and repair the park, make sure it doesn't slip too far into the time loop, but since it's magic contending with magic, it doesn't mix too well with the whole curse thing. She's definitely struggling to keep everything together since it's just her magic contending with an entire curse, but the other cast of characters tries their best to help her to maintain everything, and together they manage it well enough for the time being, at least to prevent any patrons from like getting injured or being teleported to the past. She tends to be the connective glue for the entire cast of characters. They all have a very positive relationship with her. She's a mentor to the burning field guy, which you'll see later on. She advises him on how to control his powers and helps him to put a positive spin on them. They've known each other for a really long time since he's one of the children from the original circus that she's from. She's very close to Cake Knife, who you'll also see later. She kind of treats Cake Knife like the daughter she's never had, and she's very accepting of her idiosyncrasies. This character is just, you know, really Really lived a life. I'm thinking she's previously married with her husband now passed away of natural causes. She probably has adult children somewhere out there living their lives. And she's like, hey, my retirement dream is to be cool and own an amusement park that's super sick, except for the whole curse thing. And I, of course, tried to capture all of these things, you know, the vibrant, no nonsense, hard-ass personality, the warm and loving grandmother, the water abilities, and of course the love of the finer things in life in her visual design. I love designing characters like this based off of objects that are so ornate because there's just so many things that I can pull from and it'll still basically look like the object that I'm inspired by. So for this one, I really tended to focus on shapes. I kind of just looked at shapes in the reference image and I thought, okay, what can this be realistically in an outfit? And this was especially fun to do for an outfit 
fit for an older character because I'm just not as used to designing those types of characters. So I base most of the design over a large shape that's just like this flowing robe kind of shawl looking thing. I gave her an asymmetrical dress underneath that has a lot of motifs inspired by the reference image. Some boots and leggings once again with some motifs. Some simple gloves, a bunch of clutter jewelry, a little hat inspired by the very top of the reference image. And I feel like the main focal piece here are kind of like some hair socks that are inspired by some of the curved elements on the reference. We're getting into some real like Padme Amidala territory here. And I kind of finished off the design by adding a lot of mermaid inspired, sea inspired elements. Like I've got two little mermaids at the very bottom of the shawl. I've got some scale textures in various places on the outfit. And of course she also has a little cane staff that has some fish fin elements on that as well. Overall, I was really fighting my maximalist gene on this whole design. I'm sure you can tell. I had to erase a couple of things because I was like, you know what? That's maybe too much. But overall, I really like how she looks. After all, is there anything cooler than retiring and being the metaphorical mafia boss for like the sickest carnival ever? Next up, we have the monster cake image. And oh my gosh, I had so much fun with this character. This is one of my favorite archetypes, you know, cute, but also dangerous, a little girly, but will cut you. It's just kind of the best. So I did kind of end up drawing this character basically twice because I finished the first one and it had a more extreme pose and I was just like not that happy with the design of it. So I redrew it again. So that's what you're seeing here, but you will see the other one at the end of the video as well. So this character has two major roles in the fair. She is first and foremost, the knife specialist. She does every kind of knife act under the sun. She does throwing knives. She does impalement arts. She is both the lady pinned to the wheel who is having knives thrown at her and the lady doing the throwing depending on what day it is. And by extension, she also has knife skills in the kitchen because she is the head chef, head baker of the entire amusement park. And of course she specializes in gratuitously decorated cakes and pastries, often with a bit of a macabre twist. She also kind of acts as head of security along with the Grim Reaper Fox. You'll hear more about him later because she is a very good fighter. She has deadly accuracy with a blade. And she also kind of acts as the right hand man to the matriarch. They have a very close trusting relationship and I feel like she's almost the daughter that the matriarch never had. And she also gets a lot out of being accepted by the head of the fair because she has been the cook at the fair for a very long time. She was the chef at the fair before it got cursed and she was also a normal human before the fair got cursed. Similarly to some of the other characters on the list, whenever the fair got cursed, weird things happened with space and time. Things got really weirdly mutated and distorted. And one day when trying one of her own monstrous cake creations, her body got mutated and twisted to have a giant mouth in the middle of her stomach. Obviously after the fair shut down for the first time, she found it very difficult to find another job as a chef. So she leaned a little bit more into the knife skills side of her skill set and did a little bit of bounty hunting for a while. And then since the matriarch is a loving, non-judgmental person, Cake Knife was able to take up her job as a chef again at the park a second time whenever it reopened. And yes, I think that Cake Knife is a cheeky little nickname that she has because she bakes cakes and she likes knives. You know, it's not that deep. I think this is a huge reason why she's so close to the matriarch and they have this strong bond because she was willing to hire her again as a chef whenever no one else was willing to. And this new iteration of the park is a place that she feels accepted in even though she now has a mouth in the middle of her stomach. And the Venn diagram of relationships, I'm thinking she is also very close to the Reaper Fox, which you will see a little bit later because that character is also from the original park and spends a good bit of time in the kitchen. And she is also close with Flaming Field Guy because he also spends a good bit of time in the kitchen and they both generally have deadpan personalities. They're a little bit emo and they have dark senses of humor. In terms of personality, I feel like Cake Knife has a, <laughs> I'm sorry I keep calling her that, but I don't know what else to call her. Uh, she has a very coy personality. She's very sarcastic. She has a very dry pointed wit. And honestly, she's a little creepy. Her way of coping with what happened to her is kind of to just lean into that persona and embrace how kind of disturbing she is now. And she has a lot of fun with it. And again, that side of her personality is at least a little bit sarcastic. Like she's not actually homicidal, but she will steal candy from a baby. On that note, this character definitely has a massive sweet tooth and is constantly just like eating candy and fruit and icing and getting a high on her own supply, as they say. This character also really leaned into that creepy, intimidating aesthetic with her appearance. I'm thinking she especially did this during her bouncy hunting days so that her identity would be a little bit masked. But I think she just keeps it up at the park because you know, people 
people don't care and this is kind of true to who she is so she just sort of embraces it. So in terms of her design itself I kind of went in the direction of pastel goth clown. Since she is a performer at the park, I wanted to give her a little bit of a showier outfit, so giving her more of a Harlequin vibe definitely felt very natural. So from there, it was figuring out how to bring this like sugary pastel cake aesthetic, and then also the aesthetic of like sharpness and teeth, and mix all that around, and it definitely took me a few tries to figure out exactly what I was doing here. So I ended up landing on kind of a poofy micro mini skirt, complete with a little apron to allude to her role as a baker, and a cutie kind of of love core top with puffy sleeves, kind of inspired by cherries. Of course, it isn't a goth look without some big old chunky thigh high boots with too many belts, so I added those complete with some little mouth motifs. She's got some fingerless gloves with ruffs, clowny ruffled collar, worn underneath a spike choker, a few harnesses for the aesthetic and to hold all of her knives, and on top I gave her some twin buns once again to allude to all of the little icing shapes on the cake as well as the cherries. I gave her some Harlequin cherry inspired makeup and of course in the middle of her abdomen she also has a giant gaping mouth with some very sharp teeth. Next up we have our spooky blood lake and hand coming out of a mirror and this is another one of my favorite character concepts in this video and as I alluded to in the character breakdowns I ended up making this one the amusement park's resident ghost affectionately referred to as the hag of mirrors because guess what this ghost likes to haunt the park's hall of mirrors. So I imagined this character to kind of be that ghost ghost archetype where they have a really creepy visual appearance, but they're relatively harmless in their little ghostly hijinks. So this character does originate from the original park before our matriarch kind of refurbished it. So she kind of does have a little bit of a dark backstory. I'm thinking she drowned there as a child, was kind of murdered basically, and then her body was hidden in the Hall of Mirrors and ever since she just has unfinished business. Her appearance has grown old even though she's dead due to all of the weird time hijinks that are happening there and no one really knows what her unfinished business is or why she's there so she kind of just hangs around and haunts the park out of pure spite and she kind of does what I plan on doing whenever I become a miserable old woman she entertains herself by messing with all of the patrons and the park employees in terms of the appearance of this character I didn't go too hard I kind of kept it dialed back and relatively simple I, I kind of just made her a hooded hunched over figure and a long robe but then I did incorporate the elements of blood portals. I gave her long flowing sleeves that are red on the inside kind of dripping blood and the red claw like hands from the mirror image and then I gave her some fun little gold ornamentation to also allude to the frame from that image and then finally some spooky antlers that kind of look like tree branches with snow dripping off of them and kind of snow dripping off of her entire outfit and then a mostly shaded over face where you can only see a little bit of her sharp jowls peeking out of the bottom. Like I discussed in the breakdown I think this character has teleporting or dimensional jumping abilities. They can kind of jump between dimensions using any reflective surface or mirror. So that means actual mirrors like you would find in Hall of Mirrors, pools of water, puddles, and even just any reflection on glass or anything. She can kind of pop out of and spook you. And to allude back to the red pool in the snow, I think that would kind of be her purgatory or home dimension that she travels from as a hub to get to any other reflection. She kind of goes through the pool and that's why the two images that I laid out are kind of linked. I think this character's ability to haunt the park, especially some of the spookier rides in the park, does contribute to the overall atmosphere and whimsy because obviously patrons of the park have seen her and have shared like, oh, I think that the park's actually haunted. I've seen a ghost. So she does have her role to play with the prestige and the allure of the park. But I also think that she's kind of like a big pain in the butt for the most part. Sometimes she will just kidnap children and make them get lost and disappear in the hull of mirrors and you have to bargain with her in order for her to kind of set them free. She will usually accept a blood offering, aka a turkey leg, or a stick of cotton candy. Some of her other mischievous pastimes include showing up in the dunk tank and scaring people, as well as appearing in the bottom of the tub when people are bobbing for apples. I just really love it whenever ghosts behave a little bit more like human beings and have more petty motivations and reactions to things. You know, I just, I love a ghost with a lot of little idiots 
idiosyncrasies. So on my notes here, I also have written, doesn't speak, only utters an ominous frequency only cats can hear, sometimes leaves trails of blood, she is sorry, likes pet goldfish and koi, we'll put them in her pond portals to keep as pets. That's another little offering you can give her in exchange for a stolen child. I also have written, likes to knit, warm garments will show up in the park randomly, they are gifts. And finally, she likes it cold. Will she use her ghostly portals to cause a snowstorm in the middle of the summer? Yes, she will. She's vindictive. In terms of her relationships with other characters, I feel like she more or less gets along with most people neutrally. Like, they coexist. She's not particularly close with anyone. Like, if anything, I feel like she and Cake Knife mess with each other the most. But I feel like her most cruel tormenting can be directed towards the mother because she's trying to make her feel guilty for reopening the park and having the living walk amongst the dead, not allowing them to rest. You know, I get it. If I were a ghost, I'd be a little annoyed if people were also constantly around me. So there's a little bit of tension there. Next up, we have our burning field image and our little Venus flytrap smoking a cigarette. I was super excited to work on this one because first of all, I think this is a super cool concept for a character. I love duality. I love clashing themes. And also this is just going to give me an opportunity to design a cool guy character. And I have to say, I am warming up a little bit to designing cool guy characters. Did we think we would be hearing me say that? Probably not, but hey, new year, new me. <laughs> so for this one, I wanted to design your classic brooding emo little guy. You know, this character, he's Zuko coded. He's Zoro coded. He has pyrokinetic abilities and yet he's probably a vegan. So this is another one of the little kiddos that the matriarch took in after the old circus was attacked. He was also a fire dancer there alongside his parents, but at one point he experienced an accidental burn during one of his performances as a child and that burn kind of tempered him him, giving him fire abilities and heat resistance, you know, pyrokinesis. He's a firebender. I'll say it. He's a firebender. So again, this universe is magical realism. Superpowers are realistic, apparently. So this accident also makes his skin hot to the touch. So he has a difficult time touching anything organic without burning it. If he touches a human being for too long, it will definitely burn their skin, at least leave like a little sunburn, if not worse. But his abilities especially affect anything that's organic and a little bit more delicate like plants. Any plants that he touches, he'll basically scorch. And if he's not careful enough, he can even outright catch them on fire. And he loves plants. He's a little botanist guy. He loves to study them. He loves to be around them. Gardening is something that he used to do with his parents that he now feels is lost to him because he can't really be around the plants. So as a result, he's kind of just angry and sad and emo. Being around him is a little bit of a drag, but I'm thinking he becomes very close to the matriarch because she's kind of a surrogate mother for him, definitely a mentor figure. And since she does have clairvoyant abilities and understands the use of an element since she can control water, she kind of helps him to redirect his fire ability gift to be able to connect with plants and organic matter in a new way. I'm thinking he burns so hot internally that he kind of gives off UV rays and even generates heat. So even though he can't really physically touch plants, plants still like being around him. If he doesn't get too close, he can kind of help them grow. He likes to take plants and put them in little propagation stations and cloches on his belt so they receive sunlight from being close to him and hence the sun in the original reference image I'm using I do see this more as solar kinesis rather than a strict pyrokinesis that's why he gives off UV rays so like the reference image I'm thinking he also helps to burn fields so that crops get new nutrients every season and since most fairs are big producers of food I think that he's also kind of important in the cooking process he can light fires and grills and regulate temperature. I'm thinking whenever Cake Knife is working on an especially delicate recipe for some kind of pastry, he's instrumental in regulating the temperature and making sure that everything gets thoroughly cooked. Because they spend so much time together cooking, I feel like Cake Knife, my fire guy, and the future Fox Reaper are a little trio. They're kind of also the muscle of the group, so they all get along together really well, and I especially feel like maybe the fire guy and Cake Knife, they, they get along pretty well. Maybe they're a ship, I don't know. So even though he kind of hates his abilities and resents that this happened to him because he can't interact with living things the way he used to, he kind of learns how to do it in a new way and has a new appreciation for it. And that especially comes in handy with his fire dancing because now the fire can't really hurt him. He can kind of do whatever with it. And that is of course his primary role in the park. He is a performer and a fire dancer. And I feel like that definitely shows in his design because he is very, very fire forward. I kind of wanted to just go all out with this and make it 
it look very anime. So of course his primary weapons and tools for fire dancing are a pair of whips because of course they are. And for his outfit, I really wanted to lean into that duality. So I kind of gave him on one side a cool leather coat that's got flames all over it and it's sort of parted halfway down the middle and draped over around his waist. And to match that, he's got some poofy flaming pants on the bottom. And to play on that whole duality theme, I thought that it would be cool if this coat was more of like a color block coat. So it's half like flaming black and the other half is more of a green color. So the green half is more open, revealing his arm and a little bit more skin. So underneath that, he has a little green vest, a spooky Venus flytrap shoulder pauldron, and of course, a collection of little propagation vials and cloches strapped around his belt. I of course also gave him some wild flaming hair because I feel like you just kind of have to with this kind of character. And I also gave him a bunch of visible scar tissue on one half of his body to allude to how he got his flame abilities, complete with an eye patch to avoid any full-on Zuko vibes. And I'm not encouraging smoking, don't do it, it's real bad for you, but he is also smoking a cigarette to allude to the Venus flytrap image. I was gonna put the cigarette in the little flytrap pauldron's mouth, but then I thought, you know what? He can probably take it better than the flytrap can. Next, we have our little cicada image. I wanted to keep things pretty simple for these characters just because there are so many characters in this ensemble group, but I imagine that these two are fraternal twin siblings and aerial slash trapeze artists. These are some more children that fell under the matriarch's care after the old carnival was attacked, and so the matriarch has very much become their grandmother figure. As I was discussing in the breakdown, these two have a ton of contrast, so they are basically polar opposites. They don't get along very well, there's usually a lot of conflict going on, and that is escalated by the fact that they actually have sibling telepathy. They can hear each other's thoughts, so the conflict basically never stops. But this also at the same time makes them very effective trapeze and aerial performers. They also do, especially as they get older, have the ability to feel a lot of empathy for each other because they can literally feel each other's pain. And when they actually try to put in the conflict resolution skills, they can be pretty effective communicators. So so since this amusement park carnival thing is kind of centered in the forest and focuses on a lot of the natural whimsy of nature, I think that in the aerial shows they dress up in a lot of naturally inspired costumes. So these two are kind of a bug act and they're sort of a literal depiction of a cicada shedding its exoskeleton. So obviously the girl sibling whose personality is a little bit more charismatic, attention seeking, kind of the natural born star would fall into the role of the cicada post molt, making the boy sibling by default fall into the role of the exoskeleton, which he's not very happy about because he's like, hey, you know what? I'm just as talented, if not more talented. I'm very strong and rugged. I deserve a little bit of recognition too, instead of only falling into a support role. I feel like their dynamic is he's actually a little bit more naturally talented than she is. Like he's very skilled, but he gets stage fright. He's very shy. He doesn't really like to put himself out there and she's talented, but her personality and star power kind of carries her a little bit more. So obviously from here, conflict ensues. Maybe they have to eventually come to an agreement and swap costumes once in a while so that one of them doesn't just fall into a default role that they don't really want to be in. I don't know. I think their big arc would be about finding individuality and breaking away from the preset roles that they are forced into simply because they are twins. Even though they're not identical twins, they still get forced into it. And what better a place to do that than a wacky, goofy amusement park that has a giant fox plushie and a girl with teeth in her stomach. In terms of dynamics, obviously they get along really well with the aforementioned giant fox plushie. They're definitely close with the matriarch, their surrogate grandmother, and they even enjoy engaging in hijinks with the park ghost. But one character they really don't get along with is Cake Knife. She's super annoyed by them and definitely will take candy from them. But I feel like the little twin boy is definitely very intrigued by Burning Field Guy. He thinks he's real cool. He's trying to like model his look after him a little bit. He always just kind of wants to ask if he can go with burning field guy while he does his gardening, but the little cicada dude is just kind of shy. He's not quite there yet. Since these are kind of performance costumes, in terms of design, I kind of struggled to make them super interesting or complex because I was kind of trying to do more of a literal translation. So that's basically what I ended up doing. I did look a little bit at different performance costumes to see if there's anything I can emulate and I ended up doing that a little bit, but for the little girl, it's mostly just a jumpsuit with wings that's kind of based on the color 
exploration of the cicada. And for the little boy, he's got some plate armor that's kind of based on the exoskeleton. But other than that, he's, he's got a pair of wings and just some general rugged clothes. Not super complex, but I think they're pretty cute. And for the record, like I'm pretty sure this bug is a cicada. I looked it up, it looks like a cicada, but if it's not and I'm totally wrong, then just let me know what the heck it is. And last up, we have the character that I thought would be my favorite character from this bunch, and I proved myself absolutely right, this little fox grim reaper fellow. And oh my god, I, I just, I love him so much. I have to say, in terms of design for this guy, it was pretty straightforward. I was really just going in and like exaggerating the shape of the plushie itself and trying to make it look even more huggable and friendly, just like a big guy, a big fellow that you could travel with and just really trust to protect you and have your back and give you a big old hug whenever, you know, you get your socks wet or something like that. And once I drew a big huggable guy, I focused on just giving him some like edgy accessories based on the other reference that I had. I of course had to give him a coffin and a bunch of chains and some weird excessive belts. And I was gonna stop at that, but then I wanted to make his clothing look a little bit closer to the figure that's in the image. So I also went on to give him like a nice leather coat. And I also gave him some little anime protagonist sleeves that don't connect to the jacket as well as some bulky gloves that will help him whenever he's swinging around his sword. And to finish out the design, I also gave him some tall boots to step on enemies with and look fabulous. And of course, they also have to have entirely too many buckles. An important detail that I didn't end up adding until a little later on is a little peg on his neck that looks like one that you would find on a wind-up toy because I was trying to work in like the cursed animatronic part of the prompt into this whole world building situation and the best way that I found to do that is to make this fellow a former animatronic that was cursed with sentience and grim reaper abilities apparently. My little origin story for this character is that he was a former animatronic at the park before the mother kind of took it over and refurbished it and when he was put into storage the old owners draped a bunch of props from some of the scary rides over him so chains, a coffin, a sword and so as a result when he was cursed those props became part of his personality. So he's like a grim reaper, but his primary personality still kind of defaults to his cuddly fox animatronic personality, because obviously that's kind of the biggest part of who he is. But now maybe he's a cool sword fighter because the sword he had came from a previous like stuntman act or something along those lines. And his coffin also has magical powers because it previously was a prop on one of the spookier rides and that was the lore that was attached to it. So hear me out, but I'm thinking since the coffin is kind of this contained object, it can kind of channel some of the abilities of the overall curse that is affecting the park. So it can effectively harness the time reversal curse. So if someone or something is placed inside of the coffin, it can cause people to have amnesia, it can heal their wounds, and it can generally just do some funky time reversal stuff on whoever is stuck inside of the coffin. Am I saying the coffin is a time machine? A little bit. I'm a little bit saying that this coffin is now a time machine. I'm thinking this and other contained objects are basically the most tangible way they can interact with the curse without seeing things that they previously repaired just suddenly become broken again or things just generally repeatedly going wrong at the park because otherwise if time was just literally always flowing backwards I think that would be a really ridiculous narrative to try to attempt and I'm not going to try to attempt that so on that tangible note uh, things can't travel into the future with this little weird coffin time machine. Things can only go backwards. You can only like heal wounds that previously happened. And by extension, that would also cause someone to have amnesia because their brain reverts back to where it was, you know time travel things. So in terms of personality, obviously this character is very friendly, huggable, lovable, himbo type energy, very helpful, kind of possesses this contagious positivity, but he also doesn't fully understand people because he's, you know, newly human and fairly blunt, a little naive. I'm sorry I keep using Buffy references, but he's giving Anya just a little bit. I imagine he's very much just a support character for the whole group, like something's bugging you, sit down, let's talk about it, I'm here for you, man. I feel like that would be particularly true for the mother matriarch character because she's probably under a ridiculous amount of stress with this park, you know? And as a former animatronic under a curse, he doesn't experience stress in the same way she does, so he can shoulder more of that burden without being under as much pressure. I also feel like this character would be particularly close with our monster cake girl because I think he would be interested in baking and cooking and those kinds of hobbies. 
recipes, and as head chef, head baker, she would instruct him on how to make things and not blow up souffles in the oven. I also think as a huggable, lovable Grim Reaper and a pastel pink death metal goth, they would make quite a complimentary dynamic duo. He would obviously also get along really well with the kids. I can see him running around after them trying to get them to behave and just failing completely, but in the most endearing way possible. Hello and welcome to the end of this very long video. I hope you guys liked that it was long. I keep doing this, but I just don't feel like there's any other way to actually explain like what the characters are all about and what I decided the lore to be without it just being a little bit long-winded. But I hope you enjoyed the designs this week. I had an absolute blast working on them. I always enjoy kind of like world building and character building and just using little prompts like this as a jumping off point to get a little bit creative. I'm sorry if my voice was extra cracky this week. I've been doing so much talking just in the last like couple of hours and my voice is just kind of going through it. But as always, I encourage you, please, these guys, first of all, need names. I'm so sick of calling them things like burning field guy and cake knife. So please leave name suggestions in the comments down below. And second of all, as always, I encourage you if you want to write little fan fictions or just speculate about what these characters are like or add on to the story in any way, feel free to in the comments down below. And if you have anything else for me, you can DM me on Instagram. If you do a fan art or anything related to these characters, you are required by law to show me. But as always, the biggest thank you for this video and for every single one of my videos goes to my wonderful patrons and especially my executive producers. You guys are the real seven foot fox plushie that I want to hug. I'm not saying that name on the internet. ABW Makes, Bellfire1053, Samalama MC Samabama, Sarah, Crimson Moon 04, Liana, Ermler Jean, Anubix, Breeza, Sony, Brian, Phoenix, Rose Draconi, Freedom and Gus Gus, Francesca Sliwa, Cat Dodo, Xyle S, The Cat Spark, Agent Dot Sketchy, Bea Maia, Lovisa, Eloquent Silence, Megan Penland, Enozine, India Gloom, Hypnos, Katie, Sweet Winter Garden, Gravity Drop, I Hang Out with Cats at Parties, and Bean the Bread.